when Stephen invited me out and said, hey, do you want to come up to Portland and uh, give a talk and uh, drink some great beer? I said, great. It's only a two-hour flight from San Francisco. And, uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I realized exactly what I had gotten myself into. I'm still sort of figuring that out. So, um, but I'm happy to be here, um, and I'm happy to be here right now after last night, so you weren't kidding. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, I guess a uh, quick little bio, um, and then we'll get uh, into the, the meat. Um, so, um, uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, for about uh, eight and a half years, I worked at Google. Um, I left last year um, to work on some other projects, uh, some, some better than others. Uh, I just uh, try some new things. Um, Kegbot, what I'll be talking about was a side project for much of the, you know, the, the time where I had a real job, and uh, I've been spending a little more time on it lately, so it's one of the things that uh, I've been uh, playing around with. Uh, there's a commercial side of it, which I'm not going to talk about, we're going to focus on the uh, open source project. Yeah, my goal is basically to just tell you about uh, Kegbot, how it works, kind of its uh, hardware and software. I heard this crowd is somewhat technical, so we'll get into some of the technical stuff. We did a Kickstarter recently, um, earlier in the year, so I just have some random little nuggets of information about that. Maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not. Uh, if you have questions, shout them out. We should have time at the end, too. Okay, so uh, origins. So basically, um, back in 2003, um, I was between uh, undergrad and grad school, and uh, you know, I had no job, uh, and you know, was drinking beer, uh, somewhat often. Um, and I had uh, you know, a couple roommates who were all very cheap. So um, we, we had kind of this uh, eternal question, um, how much beer is left? And then the other et eternal question, who's been drinking all? <laughs> who's had more than their fair share? Who can I charge? Uh, my other roommate built an expense tracking thing for you know, who's paid what. And we, were, uh, we had a lot of trust uh, between each other. Um, so the basic idea that uh, you know, I was sitting around thinking of was basically sense the volume of the beer as it's poured from a draft beer system, log it to a database, and show some charts and stats, and profit. <laughs> of course, after a few minutes of that, uh, you know, I realized if we could figure out who was tied to each pour, then there's even more stuff we could show. You know, we could say that Mike's drinking more than Eric. Um, so revise the plan, step one, make everyone log in. Sense the volume as it's poured, log it, show charts, and profit. And then after a few more minutes of thought, I realized, wait, 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 no one's going to voluntarily log in if they're drinking all my beer. So require them to log in by opening a valve when they do. <laughs> Sense the volume of beer, log in, show charts, profit. And then if you think about this kind of idea, you know, um, you realize that there's a lot of really, you could get as crazy as you want. Um, you know, you can text when you know a keg is tapped, email me when it's low, tweet when someone pours, play a sound, invoices. I went crazy with billing. Um, I had this, this grand uh, idea that some of my friends would get the beer at cost. So the undesirable is we get you know, a higher bracket of uh, 10 cents an ounce instead of five. And the invoices come to us. <laughs> so uh, not all of this was uh, is implemented today, but uh, there were a lot of experiments. <laughs> So yeah, so this is what the hardware looks like. Um, what you see here is uh, a, a solenoid valve, um, a collection of fittings, and uh, on the lower right here um, is a flow sensor. Um, all the brass fittings, not the best choice, if, unless you like the you know, crisp taste of brass in your beer. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I got the, the valve from uh, uh, McMaster Car, and I found some fittings at Home Depot, and we're off to the races. Uh, here's another look at uh, a different flow sensor. But um, I can, I'll talk just really quickly about how this works. Um, there's a paddle wheel that I, actually, before I do that, when you start looking into flow sensors, you went to a weird and you know, wonderful world of the industrial uh, process automation, hardware, that kind of stuff. And uh, there's lots of different types of flow sensors. Many of them are very expensive and do things like acoustically, you know, that I, I can't even tell you. I can only describe this. But uh, this is a relatively low cost design where there's a paddle wheel inside. It's usually uh, magnetized, and there's a Hall effect sensor that uh, acts as a pickup. So every time the wheel turns, you get a click, and that uh, has a, a, a very uh, precise correspondence to the amount of uh, the volume of the beverage passing through. So count the clicks, count the volume, and uh, you know there's other ways to uh, measure uh, keg volume. You know another technique is to use a scale or a strain gauge. Um, this is a very high resolution. You know, these meters will know down to the millimeter. Um, What's been, uh, what's been going through. Here's what the hardware looked like. Uh, this is circa 2003-2004, so um, 
for any of you hardware hackers out there, this was time before um, Arduino, before decent tool chains, uh, before being able to program microcontrollers uh, over USB and not you know, a parallel port or high voltage programmer. So everything that powers all the wonderful stuff we've seen on Kickstarter today and uh, you know, all these uh, you know, personal devices, Fitbits and stuff, th these were the bad old days. Yeah, in the corner there is a, is a relay, which I used for um, toggling my fridges, or my freezer's thermostat. If you've ever built a kegerator before, one option you can uh, pursue is to get a chest freezer and uh, regulate the thermostat so that it turns on less, or sorry, regulate the compressor. Um, so I was like, great, I'm going to do everything on this microcontroller. I'm going to do the volume, and I'm gonna, going to uh, control my thermostat. I don't want to pay 50 bucks for a, a thermostat. Well, I screwed up, uh, and the, uh, the firmware froze, and uh, the beer froze. So uh, it was my first freeze, uh, and uh, then I decided, you know what, maybe it is worth $50 to do like a real thermostat. If you've never frozen a keg of beer, it usually doesn't burst, but uh, it'll come out as a nice uh, foamy milkshake for the rest of its woeful existence. <laughs> uh, here is uh, just someone pouring a drink on the first interface. Um, this is a character LCD. Again, back in 2003, 2004, it was state of the art. Um, I tried. I remember trying to find uh, touch screen suppliers, and they wouldn't even talk to me for their shitty touch screens. And uh, I should have this down. Um, so easy lessons learned. Uh, the basic idea works. Um, obviously, simplify the controller. Don't try to do too much. Um, and lots of potential for fun stuff on the web. I uh, I didn't show kind of the early uh, web interface, but um, you know there was a lot of room to grow. And of course, don't use brass fittings until you use your hair. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to talk about what the system looks like today. Um, so here is one picture. Actually, we haven't uh, uh, launched this interface, but this is an Android tablet running next to the tablet, showing you basically who's bored, what's left, uh, recent events. And it's through this interface that you can uh, you can either use it in read-only mode, where you're just kind of seeing as you pour, or you can do all that fancy logging and stuff. Here's another form factor, uh, which I call the Jockey Bot, which is a portable keg bot, which I brought to uh, some friends' parties and stuff. Um, a little closer look. Um, here is a, uh, a TV interface we recently designed. This uh, is sort of primitive, I'm not a designer, if you couldn't tell, but um, this is something that you can uh, put up on your uh, you know, your Chromecast or uh, any other you know, web uh, display and then just show off your tablets. Uh, so the major components here, um, we have the microcontroller, uh, obviously. Um, there's, uh, these are architectural components. So um, there's a sensor loop whose job is basically to service those microcontrollers and report them to the back end. There's the back end and the front ends. So uh, I'll dive into uh, these in a little more detail. So uh, today the microcontroller is an Arduino or it's based on Arduino, which is just another way of saying it's an ABR that uses the uh, Arduino tool chain, which is very popular among hobbyists. Um, the overarching philosophy I have is to keep the hardware part very simple. Um, I, uh, one of my first jobs was writing uh, device drivers uh, in, the, in the kernel, and uh, obviously kernel people, are, you know, they will harp on you about you know, separation of user space from kernel space, separate policy from mechanism, and the main idea is it's hard to debug a microcontroller like it is hard Debug the kernel, so put as little as possible there. And uh, yeah, do everything specialized uh, that you must do in hardware and then do everything else with the stack. Here's what the first hardware, uh, uh, the first uh, Arduino shield um, uh, I, I built uh, looks like. So um, if you're not familiar with Arduino, it's just uh, a uh, you know, rapid kind of microcontroller platform. And people build little modules that plug into it. So rather than build the whole integrated system, you know, it's working mm -hmm. at the time, I didn't have a lot of time to support this, I laid out a, a shield that people could assemble, find the parts, and uh, um, build themselves. Yeah. So it has a few different blocks, there's relays on that for switching valves on and off, there's an ID scanner, the RFID reader, and some other stuff. And that's what it looks like um, as a bare board, and that's what it looks like assembled. Um, authentication, there's a lot of ways you can actually identify yourself to a Kegbot system. This is one that uses iButtons, which are little plug-in tokens. Um, you might see them in like cash register systems. Here's something I did one weekend. Um, I put an RFID reader in my drip tray, and then I uh, put some RFIDs on the bottom of the mugs. <laughs> so uh, you swipe your mug, and hello, Mikey. Uh, really, you're having a drink? Uh, okay. uh, and uh, the firmware. Uh, can't read this, doesn't really matter too much. It, it's pretty simple. Um, we just wait for information from the flow sensors, uh, 
periodically check the temperature sensors and spit it all up, uh, up to whoever's listening. Um, the sensor loop, uh, so basically, yeah, this is just kind of describing that software component that uh, sits on the, uh, the sensors. Initially, I implemented this as like a Python program, so when you, or initially when you would build a kegbot, uh, you get a Linux box, you plug in this USB board, run this command line program, and you know, hide the box behind your fridge somewhere, which, you know, is not the, the sexiest setup, but it worked. And today, this all happens inside an Android app. Um, where you, uh, I use the uh, USB host features of Android to plug the port directly into Android. Uh, the back end is a pretty conventional Django application. Um, it's about 50% uh, kind of styled web pages, like the interface that you log into, which you can see at uh, demo.kegbot.org. And uh, the other half is servicing the API that the tablet app needs to talk to. And it uh, supports multiple users, multiple taps. Um, whether you have a single system or a large fleet, um, you can do that in a single uh, back end. These are just kind of the, um, the essential concepts that are on the system. There's users, there's drinks, there's kegs. Um, one thing that uh, the system does is it groups drinks into a session. So if uh, you go, uh, I think it's up to 90 minutes or maybe three hours um, without pouring, uh, the session is ended. But all adjacent pours go into the session, which um, provides for a really interesting way to look at the stats. Um, you know, you can see how long sessions typically last. You know, do you, do you go for a drink? once a night, or it's, you know, a five-hour session might be a party. Um, so there's a lot of fun statistics you can pull out. Um, statistics are generated um, when you pour a drink. Um, you can get statistics per keg, per user, per session, globally, you know, all these different views of the same data. And it's totally derived, so um, we could blow away the statistics table and regenerate it just from the raw drink data. If you have an idea for a new statistic, uh, we can do that too. Um, there is a uh, feed of events that drives kind of the API and some of the integrations. So you can post to Twitter, you can post to Facebook, you can write your own uh, webhook based receiver to uh, listen to events like, you know, Mikey is tapping the keg, or Mikey's drinking at 6 a.m., what's going on? Mikey's talking about the events. And it's got a RESTful API. Uh, not too much to show here, um, but it's. Uh, um, here you can see um, the view of basically what's on tap. So there's a, a database of uh, beer information, uh, uh, the current volume remaining, recent history, that sort of thing. And here's some you know, examples you could, uh, you could do in your uh, command line. So that was kind of the back end, which is the web app. Um, on the front end, we have the, uh, the Android app. Um, so it looks something like this. Um, it's Again, I'm not a designer. It's somewhat primitive. But the, the goal is just to show you what you're drinking at the uh, and uh, give you a way to authenticate. Click a button, select your account, and <laughs> pouring. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have an animation, but, um, but what you see here is something that uh, I think uh, was sort of an accidental innovation. You know, I had a tablet, and the real reason I had a tablet was just to get the data off the sensors. You know, I didn't want to build an expensive Wi Fi, Ethernet sensor board, I just use a cheap Android tablet. <laughs> And I realized, oh wow, it's got a front-facing camera. We can do something like that. So um, it takes a picture when you pour. Uh, you can retake your picture, obviously. Some people turn it off. Um, it does. You, you know, I, I haven't run the uh, the report in a while, but most of the pictures are people flipping off the camera. <laughs> but you do get a uh, creative picture sometimes. Um, and I'll show you some more pictures of that. Here's uh, a somewhat outdated screenshot, um, but this is the. Um, kind of the system-wide statistics view. One statistic that uh, I really like is if you see this bar graph at the bottom left, that is, uh, for the whole system, the volume by day of the week. And uh, you can also drill into this by user, too. If you go to my profile page, you'll see volume by day of the week. And uh, I always strive to have a graph that looks like this, which means I'm not drinking the same amount <laughs> every day continuously throughout the week. If it's flat, it means something different than uh, a chart like this. So, you know, Two weeks ago. Um, here is statistics for a single keg. Again, it's a sort of old screenshot, so it looks a little janky in a few places, but um, basically divvying it up by who's drinking the most. Um, and you see at the bottom, uh, there's, uh, there's individual discreet drinking sessions that went into that. <coughs> Here's some of the pictures of uh, my friends. <laughs> my friend Brian loves to uh, try to think of a new uh, picture every time. My friend John just won a poker tournament and he's rubbing it in my face. <laughs> Um, and actually, you know, I, I brought it to a few weddings of my friends at bachelor parties. I, in the 
jockey box format. And it has a nice, you know, aside from the goofy pictures, you know, it's kind of an automatic uh, photo booth for, uh, you know, the, the party. Um, it's, uh, we have some fun, some good pictures, a lot of bad ones, but uh, good ones. Um, you can connect it to various social networks, and, you know, I didn't come with any uh, grand visions or, or, or ideas to, to give you, but um, obviously I think um, well, one thing I've noticed since doing this project is a lot has changed in the past ten years, certainly, but even the past five years in terms of how people react to this, like the, having this kind of data collected and reported and making it public, and I think to a great extent we have Facebook to thank of it for that, you know, the uh, diminishing sanctity of, uh, of, of personal privacy, but also uh, personal metrics. Um, you know, five years ago, people would be like, oh, that's crazy, and today, um, Pegbot is a lot like Fitbit in some ways. It's maybe something you're already doing. <laughs> 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 and, and uh, just giving you the data. <laughs> um, and it tweets, of course. Everything has to tweet, so. Um, so, uh, I, I think I'll now I'll tell you a little bit about the hardware I designed. Um, as I mentioned, that it's been an open source project for, um, for quite a while. Um, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll just let this go, because I could be talking for four minutes and it still be assembling at 10x speed. It's a lot of work, or it was a lot of work, to build a controller board. So as I found myself with a little more time, I said, how can I make this easier? A lot of beer enthusiasts like yourself, um, uh, startup break rooms, um, home brewers, that kind of thing, these people would approach me and say, wow, this is great, but I have no idea how to do this. Like, can you just build one for me, or can you assemble it? And it was something I, I um, wasn't able to do until recently, just because I had other stuff going on. So, um, yeah, this, this goes on forever. Uh, this, this is thanks to a guy named Adam up in uh, Seattle, I think. Uh, but, you know, it is a lot of work. So, um, this is kind of step two in the path of uh, designing your own hardware. So, the first step, which I didn't show, is laying out uh, the schematic, which is kind of how all the components connect to each other, and then doing the board level design. You know, that's, uh, the first one is all the logical connections, and then you need to figure out how to fit it all um, on a board, and how to wrap it all. So, at the top, you have the original board. And at the bottom, you have the first kind of printed uh, layout test of the bottom board. So step two or three here is you print out how you think the board should look, and then to arrange the individual components on top of the board to make sure you didn't screw up. Um, this is a lot like kind of a CAD or architectural project where um, you know maybe you flipped one component accidentally while you were designing it. Uh, make sure you didn't do that. It's kind of a, a check. Um, the next step is building a real prototype. So um, this is the first uh, board I assembled. Uh, I, I got the board from a place that specializes in small batches, and I sourced all the components, you know, from Digikey, which is a supplier that uh, sells these tiny little surface mount parts. Normally, a machine builds these boards, so doing this by hand can be tedious, especially to someone who sucks at surface mount soldering, like me. Um, so this might be the second board. I don't remember if the first one worked, but this one worked, and it was a good little test, you know, it, it, it kind of proved that the basic form factor worked. By the way, I guess I didn't mention, but um, that, that other board had a lot of stuff on it. And uh, one step here, it's part of kind of understanding um, the customer and understanding the, you know, what I should build, um, was removing a lot of the stuff that was in the board. There's no block of relays um, and there's no RFID reader. Most people, you know, the, the, the overarching need was just knowing how much volume is left in the keg. So I made a conscious decision to simplify um, just to get something that would serve everyone and then maybe address those other needs with other modules or other boards later. Uh, this shot is uh, from um, our uh, contract manufacturing uh, assembly partner. Uh, they are awesome. They're named uh, Worthington Assembly, and they're based in uh, Massachusetts. Um, so what you see here is uh, panels of boards. So um, when you make a board that's small, usually you have a lot more space on the, you know, on the fiberglass, or whatever, the, uh, the PCB. So you, uh, you clone it, and uh, then you break it up after you assemble it. You know, the, Machines can operate on a one inch by two inch board, but they can operate on a, a larger board, just like you know, printing labels on a printer. Um, this this part I, I wasn't there for, but I would have loved to do. Um, so you have these panels of boards, and then you need to break them apart, and it's literally like breaking a graham cracker. Uh, I got a video from Worthington uh, showing their uh, employee doing this, and it looks so satisfying. Some days <laughs> fighting with code, it just yeah, man, I should just. Crack boards apart for a living. So <laughs> um, 
But yeah, that's kind of the, uh, the army of boards uh, post uh, depanelization, I guess it's called. And then there's a hand for scale, normal sized hand. Uh, it's one inch by two inches. So um, I was pretty pleased with the way the boards came out. Um, they, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's obviously things I'd like to do differently or, or, or add on, but the total time for building this was probably three, three or four months from kind of initial schematic to having, you know, that battalion of uh, keg boards in hand. And then uh, we went on to, um, d during this process, we launched a Kickstarter uh, to, uh, to sell these, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so, yeah, I, I wanted to, I, I, I was worried that I needed to make some insightful points, and unfortunately I don't think I'm going to, but um, over the years I've learned a couple things about running an open source project. There's many people who have done this better, but uh, so the things that I think are unique or that, that I didn't know was, number one, know how savvy your users are. Uh, this applies to anything, but a lot of open source is kind of developer focused, so you know everyone's pretty technical. In my case, you know, I was running an open source project that um, a lot of non-technical people wanted to use, and uh, it took me a long time to realize that you have to approach it a little differently. You need to have, you know, a dead simple installer, you need to have fewer options, you know, like developers love being able to, um, you know, tweak every setting and, you know, patch their own crap into, you know, the, the server or whatever. Not so with the hobby users or the, the less savvy users who just want something simple. So, and, and in particular, this applies to both current users and potential future users. Um, you know, a lot of people were probably turned off by the project because it was too hard to, uh, to build a board. And then uh, most users won't really contribute. This is true of open source. Um, you, in, in many ways, it's thankless. Um, you know, you'll get a lot of complaints, but the actual contributors who step up are, in my case, few and far between. And, and uh, you know, again, a lot of that has to do with how well you want to run the project, but even if you're you know, the best um, open source maintainer, um, you're still going to have more, more just uh, users than contributors. Uh, running a Kickstarter campaign, this was a very fun experience. Um, it was a lot of work, um, and uh, again, there's uh, a lot of a lot that can be said for it uh, by other people, probably better than me. Um, I'm sorry this isn't very uh, pretty, but um, this is basically the graph of our um, gross uh, contributions throughout the uh, cycle of the campaign. So, and it went for about three weeks. So you see there's a couple of pronounced steps here. So when we started the campaign, uh, like on a Friday night, uh, the next, or Thursday night, the next morning, I sent a tweet and, you know, I was hoping that's all I had to do marketing-wise, because I'm a marketeer and I'm not a marketeer. Um, and it, it helped, it, you know, that's basically kind of the leading edge of, uh, of people who, um, who were interested in, uh, in back again. And then um, pretty flat until we sent out um, a mailing list uh, update. So this is one of the things that uh, I learned from um, just some blogger consultant, um, just reading. Um, you know, don't underestimate the value of email in reaching out to your customers. Um, it's kind of like the old fashioned way, but as you can see, we got the biggest lift from uh, just pinging the people who we knew to already be interested, as opposed to Twitter where you're, you know, jockeying with everyone, look at my link, like me, whatever. And then finally, we got a little bit of press coverage from Engadget, and you know, it helped a bit, um, but you know, it's pretty comparable to our own mailing list. We thought Engadget would, uh, we weren't prepared, and quite frankly, we were worried, um, but uh, it, was an, it was a modest lift, and you know, it was nice to have the press coverage. Um, and uh, that brings me to kind of the other things we learned um, running the campaign. Um, You'll be scrutinized pretty heavily by Kickstarter, the company, until you aren't. Um, this is, uh, I'm sure this doesn't apply very generally to, uh, to all of us here, but if you do find yourself running a Kickstarter campaign, there is an uh, editorial review at the beginning, which can be very opaque. Um, it was time consuming, they asked for extra information on the page, particularly for hardware projects where there's kind of a history or, of people getting burned. Um, but once uh, you're approved by Kickstarter, you can continue to edit um, your Kickstarter page. You know, you can uh, satisfy their concerns and then delete it, and there didn't appear to be much scrutiny after uh, <laughs> the, uh, the review, which I, I'm not saying we did anything like that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a strange process, in, um, and uh, in, in our case, we were ready to go and then had to wait another two weeks for some guy on the other side of the, you know, the country to get back to us. 
Uh, one thing that is true, though, that you can take away is it isn't all gravy. And um, by that I mean you look at these projects and go, wow, you know, you made $40,000, you made a million dollars on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Probably not. That, that, that's not, you know, revenue. That's, you know, that's not profit. You know, that's, that's gross revenue. It turns out that um, most people, we had about 400 or so backers, and of those, uh, Kickstarter gives you an option to say, you know what, I love what this project is doing, I don't need a perk. Just uh, give them the money, and I'm proud to be you know, a contributor. It turns out that almost everyone just wants the thing. So giving them, you know, giving money, uh, Kickstarter is fighting this very, very uh, aggressively. They don't want to be seen as a store or a pre-order store. But the fact is, of the 400 or so people, all but two wanted the thing or signed up for something. And the two that said just have the money were like friends or family. They're like, OK, Mikey, yeah. I don't know what you're doing, but that <laughs> boy. Um, and this is another just kind of inside Kickstarter thing, but remember to write your tombstone. So I was looking at other projects, ones that had completed long ago, and it seemed like they never updated it. Like, it was still saying, like, we've got four days to go, hope you help. Like, what happened to this project? Kickstarter turns the page into read-only mode the second the campaign ends. And I realized this about two minutes before our campaign ends, so we quickly updated it. Uh, and now, as far as I know, it's immutable. Maybe things have changed, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it's strange the way they sort of lock you in. Um, so actually, yeah, I, I, that's that's about all I have to talk about. I'm happy to take your questions. Um, project is still just getting started. I, I hope maybe, uh, although this was somewhat rapid, I hope uh, you you might uh, you might have stoked your imagination for what's possible in our increasingly connected world. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring a demo unit, but uh, if you're ever out in San Francisco, I'd be happy to, uh, to show you. So uh, thanks a lot. Beer, you know, it's just pulling a lever. 
And um, especially so in Japan, where he said there's a, a, a cultural a preference to, uh, for being left alone. Um, at least in bar, um, this piece of So, uh, <laughs> more, more generally, uh, there are a lot of uh, self-service systems that you start seeing, and it's something that uh, you know, I'm spending a good deal of time working on um, in uh, commercial settings. So, um, we haven't uh, had the penetration that uh, we want in uh, bars and restaurants, but we haven't really started with that. Cool. Yeah. All right. We actually we we got to move on. So he's around. <laughs>